Tick tock, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's watching from all over the world, your friendly neighborhood philosopher. And with me now is the author of the Quran, the actual author of the Quran, to clear up all your questions about all the things that this book says. We have Robert Spencer. How you doing, Robert? Just great, David. How are you? <laughs> I'm good too. <laughs> all right. So anyway, the uh I'm that? full of wrath. Yeah, <laughs> he's full of wrath, ladies and gentlemen. All right, we want to we want to have that wrathful energy as we as we go through the Quran here. So we, you and I originally thought we'd we'd go around the Quran and and look at some uh, look at some various verses and so on, but uh, now we're just actually going to take a look at Surah ninety six, the the first part of which is supposedly the first revelation to Muhammad, and we're just going to have one show going through Surah ninety six of the Quran, taking a critical look. At Surah 96. So how's that? Does that sound all right to everyone? So we're gonna we're gonna take everyone up to expert level on this chapter of the Quran. Lots of interesting stuff in here. Uh, so Robert, what do you think about yep. what do you think about uh, Surah 96? Where would you like to begin, sir? Well, let's begin at the beginning. You said the first part of it contains the first revelation that Muhammad received. What's interesting is that Islamic tradition is not unanimous in saying this is the first surah, and as a matter of fact. The uh, first surah, the, uh, that is, the one that's actually number one in the book, is thought to be the first surah to have been revealed uh, by some people. As a matter of fact, the 12th century Persian Islamic scholar, Zamakshari, he says that most commentators of the, on the Quran at his time believe that the Fatiha, that is, surah one, was the first surah to have been revealed. It's interesting because you will not find any... Islamic commentators or scholars today who say that Surah 1 is the first Surah to be revealed, and they pretty much agree that it's 96. It's easy to see why that is, because 96 says, recite, and you open up Bukhari, the most important Hadith collection, and the first Hadith the, right there says, the angel appeared to Muhammad and said, recite. So if you say this is not the first Surah, then you've got to put a revelation before this and it messes up the whole Islamic story. But the whole point of what I'm saying here is that the whole Islamic story is really quite a bit more fluid than most people realize. And there was not any clear in agreement for centuries that Surah 96 really was the first Surah at all. Yeah, that and that, by the way, is, a, is an ongoing problem in Islam, namely that the farther you get away from Muhammad, the more they seem to know about Muhammad and the Quran. And and what what, what I mean here, ladies and gentlemen, is, is think about the problem here. Um, who knows more about, let's say, Jesus? Who knows more about him? Uh, me and Robert or his original disciples? Right. Obviously, his original disciples, right? That they they knew them they knew the most, and then they included certain things in their writings, and so only what got preserved is what we happen to know. Um, whereas you go to Islam, and at, at first there's all this confusion, but they become somehow greater and more clear in knowledge the longer time goes on. And so what really happens is there's all this confusion. Everything is a giant mess the earlier you get. And the later you get is when Muslim scholars have decided, oh, this is the position that we're going to defend. And then they act like nothing else has ever been a position. And they throw everything out. And that's why you can go up to Muslims today and, and they have no idea about you know, the, the original companions of Muhammad not even agreeing on which chapters are supposed to be in the Quran. They had no idea that they have uh, this these kinds of disputes. Um, how about we, uh, here's an idea, since I, have the, uh, since I have the text here, how about I just read the entire chapter, since it's short, it's only 19 verses. How about I read the entire chapter and then we can zero in on, uh, on, uh, on, on some verses. Does that work? Absolutely. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the critical Quran that David is going to be reading from. It's available now. On Amazon, Barnes and Noble, you can pre-order it. It will be out in two days. And the link is in the description box, ladies and gentlemen. And so here's what you have. And so this is what the critical Quran looks like. Notice uh, we're, 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 I mean, Rob, Robert's obviously going to be drawing on the on the commentary as he's discussing these things, but uh, we just have the uh, actual surah of the Quran up on the screen. So we'll go ahead and read through this, and then uh, and then we'll zero in on some passages. So um, the clot uh, in the name, and and by the way, uh, that's uh, that's why. That's why this chapter will be called uh, Surat al alaka I mean Surat al alak uh, that which which means the clot. So, in the name of Allah, the Compassionate, the Merciful, 
recite in the name of your Lord who creates, creates man from a clot. That's a, referring to a blood clot. Recite and your Lord is the most generous who teaches by the pen, teaches man what he did not know. Know indeed, but truly man is rebellious that he thinks himself independent. Indeed, to your Lord is the return. Have you seen him who dissuades a slave when he prays? Have you seen if he relies on the guidance or commands piety? Have you seen if he denies and is defiant? Is he then unaware that Allah sees? No, indeed, but if he doesn't stop, we will seize him by the forelock, the lying sinful forelock. Then let him call upon his comrades. We will call the Zabaniya. No, indeed, do not obey him, but prostrate yourself and draw near. So, Roberts, I'm guessing you want to focus on uh, the first five verses here, since that is a uh, that's one of the units here. Absolutely, David. Uh, and one of the interesting things is that, of course, this is a very familiar story to Muslims worldwide because this is supposed to be what Gabriel said to Muhammad. Recite in the name of your Lord who creates, creates man from clot. Recite and your Lord is most generous. In the footnotes in the critical Quran, I, say, I uh, record what the Islamic traditions say happened that Muhammad was a prosperous Arabian merchant. He was praying uh, in a cave near Mecca, uh, and uh, he prays the whole night, and an angel comes to him. The angel is not named, and that's an important thing we'll get to in a minute. Tells him to recite, and according to Bukhari's hadith, Muhammad says, I can't, I don't know how to read. So the angel then, he, Muhammad says, caught me forcefully and pressed me so hard that I could not bear it anymore. He then released to me and asked me again to read, and I replied, I do not know how to read. Thereupon he caught me again and pressed me a second time till I could not bear it any more. He then released me and asked me again to read, but again I replied, I do not know how to read. Thereupon he caught me for the third time and pressed me and then released me and said, read. Now, I think this is a very interesting story in light of the fact that many times there are angelic visitations in the Bible and generally what the angel says is, do not be afraid. That's a constant thing that angels tend to say when they encounter human beings. But this angel is positively terrifying, and he terrorizes Muhammad. Muhammad tells him three times that he cannot do what he's being commanded to do, and all the angel does is insist and press him until he agrees. So, you know, people talk about Islam and terror quite a bit. And they say that it's a religion of peace and so on. And yet this story, the foundational story of Islam, has terror right in it. It's terror at the core. That's what the angel does to Muhammad is terrorize him into obedience. And I think that actually is a paradigmatic incident for the entirety of Islam itself. Yeah. And this thing seems... Uh... I have to say this, this seems kind of demonic here, right? <laughs> You've got this, uh, and, and keep in mind, Muhammad didn't know what he was encountering first. Um, as, as, as you point out in the commentaries later, he goes to Khadija, um, you know, screaming, you know, cover me, cover me and so on that, uh, that she convinces him and she and her cousin convince him. No, 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 no. Because, uh, Muhammad doesn't know what he encountered. He's totally freaked out by it. And uh, it, it's important to note just how confusing this is, even from the perspective of, of trying to interpret what's being said, because uh, some translators will translate this as recite, in which case, if, if Muhammad's being commanded to recite, well, he could recite, you know, it could be a sort of repeat after me kind of thing. If he's being commanded to read and he's supposedly illiterate, according to uh, most, but not all Muslims, then it, it's it's very strange. In fact, uh, I believe in the study Quran, they say we should go with recite just because it doesn't make sense for a, an angel to be saying read to a, an illiterate person. But I mean, that that is the most common Muslim understanding of this. It's, it, it, <laughs> the angel comes up to him, hey, got something for you to read. Like, what are you talking about? I can't read shut up <laughs> shut up and read i said <laughs> right and so the angel roughs them all up hmm? yep he pressed him yeah the angel the angel uh roughs him up and, but i mean in, in the uh, uh in ibn asak it's saying and he, he pressed on me until i thought it was death so he's like yeah. squeeze right. he's like squishing me to death right ah! like, shut yeah. up right and so uh and and this is his first revelation but then like afterwards in the muslim sources uh in ibn asak Muhammad actually thinks that he's demon possessed by this thing. He thinks he's possessed by some poetry demon and he's, he doesn't want 
he doesn't want his tribe to be making fun of him, so he goes and tries to hurl himself off a cliff, but it won't let him. It stops, this monster stops him. No, you're not getting, you're not getting away from me. And Muhammad, <laughs> Muhammad runs, and Muhammad runs home to Khadija. And I, I just talked about this recently. Uh, where was I talking about this? Um, was that, was that with you or someone else? I can't, I don't remember what we were talking about. And I was saying, uh, you know, if if you had a a demon coming after you. Do you run to your wife? <laughs> right? I mean, what, whatever it is, if it's an army chasing you, a gang of bandits, the neighborhood bully, do you run to your wife for protection? That's 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 just really weird. And it really shows, I think, uh, uh, some of the, the psychological issues that are going on, because Muslims always point, oh, well, Muhammad had sex with a little girl. But if he was really interested in little girls, why was his first wife? 15 years older than him. Oh, you mean exactly the age his mom would have been when, you know, if, if she had survived. So Muhammad marries this mother figure. And then when something goes wrong, he runs home like a, like a little kid running to his mommy. Oh, hide me, hide me. And that's, that's actually what he says. So all kinds of problems, like from the very first revelation that Muhammad receives. And another one is who was this angel? <laughs> yeah. And that's what I've got next in the commentary that Ibn Saad, and it's important to note Ibn Saad, is a contemporary of the Hadith collectors. This is not some late tradition. This is right at the time that we are getting all the stories about Muhammad in the early ninth century. Ibn Sa'd says, verily the apostle of Allah, may Allah bless him, was commissioned to prophethood when he was 40 years old. Sarafel was with him for three years. Who, who, then now? He, who now? Sarafel. Interesting, different uh, competitor for the angel Gabriel, eh? Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, there was Curly, Mo and Larry, and then there was Shemp, Mo and Larry. And, you know, these things, they change. Uh, Sarafel was with him for three years. Then he was replaced by Gabriel, who remained with him at Mecca for 10 years at the city of his migration, Medina, for 10 years. But then uh, Ibn Sa'd says that, and then he immediately takes it away and says, those who are learned and versed in Syrah literature say from the time of the revelations, the time the revelations commenced, until he breathed his last, no one except Gabriel was with him. Okay, great. But then why does he even mention this Seraphel business at all? And where did it come from? Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's very early because it appears around the same time that the other biographical material of Mah about Muhammad first appears. So clearly, there were some Muslims who were saying Seraphel was the name of the angel who appeared to Muhammad. Now, you never hear about this now. No Muslim sources ever say that anybody but Gabriel appeared to Muhammad. And yet, here again, the earliest sources about Islam tell a different story. And the Bukhari doesn't even name the give the name of the angel in the in the earliest versions of this story. So who was it who appeared to Muhammad? Sarafel? Gabriel? Somebody else? A demon? Maybe Saraf the, the Sarafel or Gabriel figure was a demon? All these questions are out there, and they're out there because of the nature of the Islamic texts, not because some Islamophobes are reading them. And uh, as you point out um, in the notes, by the way, everyone, uh, Critical Quran uh, link is in the description box if you want to get a copy. Um, but as you point out in the notes, if, if they were just if they knew exactly who this was talking about, there never would have been any sort of need for any sort of competing tradition. So it's not like someone would just wake up one day and say, you know what, I'm going to invent this other angel and say that Muhammad was talking to this other angel. It's the same situation where the further back you go, the more confused they, they got. And later generations were able to sort of clamp down and say, this is our, this is our standard narrative and we're, we're throwing out everything else. And then somehow they just have they have more certainty as time goes on. And they're way more certain than the original uh, the original followers of Muhammad were uh, very quick comment here. Um, we have someone who didn't understand anything. I said, uh, what's wrong with what's wrong with going to your wife? Um, my friend, there's there's nothing wrong with going to your wife for in certain situations. If a gang of thugs were coming after you and you ran to your wife, you're putting your wife in danger. So if you're being chased by a gang of thugs, don't go anywhere near your wife. Uh, or get a terror. A, yeah, get as far away from your wife as you possibly can. If you think a, de a demon's chasing you and this demon just physically attacked you and you think you're, you're be it's trying to possess you and so on, you don't run to your wife because then you're putting your wife in danger from this sort of spiritual attack. Instead, just like a tiny little kid running home to mommy, Muhammad runs to his wife for protection 
from something he regards as a demonic encounter. And that is not something a 40-year-old man should be doing, right? That's something a that's something a 4-year-old, not a 40-year-old would uh would do. Anyway, that's the point. Hope you uh hope you get it now. All right, Robert, where are we uh where are we going with this? I can always pull this back. Hey, up. Uh, the the next thing in the notes is about Khadija and how he says woe is me poet or possessed. Mm -hmm. And I believe you already uh, mentioned all that and I already mentioned the contrast between the angelic visitations in the Bible and this story. So we can go on to uh verse five and six where he says actually six no indeed but truly man is rebellious that no indeed kalla it occurs three times in surah 96 and uh each time it doesn't make any sense and so if you see recite and your lord is the most generous who teaches by the pen teaches men what he did not know no indeed well wait a minute uh i thought we were just hearing about how the lord teaches men what he did not know and then we hear, no, indeed, no, what? What's being negated? Nothing, actually. It just doesn't make any sense. And that actually is a sign that what's likely to have happened here is that one to five is a unit, and then six comes from somewhere else and yeah. was pasted on at this point. And it really doesn't even follow what it comes after. Yeah, and uh, this is actually... Uh, very important in understanding what the Quran actually is, because uh, I mean, I knew that you had two different sec two different eras of revelation here, supposedly the first in the first few verses, and then uh, something that comes from later during the time of uh, Abu Jahl. Um, but I didn't notice what you point out in the notes, this problem of this no indeed. Uh, does everyone see that there? Verse six, no indeed. I didn't notice that until uh, Robert pointed it out in the critical Quran. It makes no sense. It makes zero sense when you say no indeed you're you're negating what just what just happened what you just said it's it's similar to uh, uh it's an old saying uh for for you know for interpreting text uh whenever you see a therefore check to see what it's there for right because if you say therefore you're claiming that what is coming after the therefore somehow follows from what came right before the therefore right well if you see all of a sudden in verse six no indeed this is negating this is saying no about something that was just said. Well, look at what was just said. Recite in the name of your Lord who creates, creates man from a clot. Recite, and your Lord is most generous, who teaches by the pen, teaches man what he do, does, did not know. No. What do you mean no? What the heck are you talking about? You're the one saying this stuff. Why are you denying it, right? <laughs> so uh, so anyway, so it's just, pro it's just this problem of uh, uh, the, the conclusion to draw here is what Robert just said. It really, it's obvious that things are being put together that did not belong together. And again, as far as this is, this is uh, two different uh, times of revelation, that's not disputed, right? You can go to any Muslim commentary and it'll say that the first four verses were, you know, what, what Muhammad originally, I mean, the first five verses were what Muhammad originally received. And then it's talking about a later incident with, uh, with Abu Jahl. So that's not disputed. But when you compare two different hypotheses here, the Muslim hypothesis is that this, this is Allah's eternal speech, and it's revealed to Muhammad in parts, but those parts come together like Voltron in some sort of uh, coherent fashion. So like the Constructicons forming Devastator, uh, these passages are all being put together into one coherent book. And when you, but when you actually look at it, it doesn't look like this was a coherent thought in the eternal mind of Allah. If so, if it was, why does it say no indeed? Why does he negate what he just said? It looks like you had two completely different two completely different narrations here two completely different texts and they were somehow jumbled together at some point and just stuck together even though they don't have anything to do with each other and they don't make any sense together and this transition makes absolutely no sense no indeed it makes no sense it looks like it was just jumbled together and so uh anyway yeah that so that that's the conclusion i would draw if i were looking at this i wouldn't conclude that this is uh the coherent eternal speech of of Allah. Yeah, and what's more, no indeed also shows up in verse 15 and verse 19. Yep. And it doesn't more sense in either of those than see. it does in six. And so see, it so. does look as if it might have been that these fragments were thrown together precisely because they all say no indeed, with no indication that there's any sense between one and the other. So is he then unaware that Allah sees? Verse 14, no indeed. So Allah doesn't see? Well, obviously that's not what's meant. 
It's just that we have there yet another fragment beginning. And uh, then let him call upon his comrades. We will call the Zabaniya. No, indeed. This is 19. So we do not obey him. Do not obey who? There's nobody there who we're told before we shouldn't obey. You see? Mm -hmm. So yeah. and, and that, that there, we, we will call. So this is, we here is supposedly Allah. We will call the Zabaniya. Uh, and then no, indeed. What do you mean? No, indeed. Allah is Allah denying that he's going to call the Zabaniya. It's just it's completely incoherent. Indeed. No, indeed, David. <laughs> hey, notice. I mean, follow, following this, you could just say you could just say, randomly say no, indeed, after after anything. You know what I mean? And it would it would somehow uh, be perfectly coherent, according to Islam. And so notice I can say, hey, you know, earlier I had a sandwich. No, indeed. Um, but Robert and I shall do a show. It's like, what, what, what are you talking about? You can't just randomly insert that and then go on some random topic. Right. That's anyway. the creator of the universe is perfect and eternal speech. It sure is. <laughs> Indeed. No, indeed. <laughs> no, indeed. <laughs> that, that, that should start being our catchphrase for everything. We just say no, indeed, after after everything we claim. Yes. No, indeed, David. OK. Anyway, um, the traditional break also comes in uh, another traditional break, that is, comes in verse nine, where uh, apparently this is, according to tradition, referencing Abu Jahl, as you noted before one of the Quraysh, a great enemy of Muhammad, and who apparently threatened Muhammad. And so the rest of this could be invective about him. But with all the breaks in the narrative, there's no clear certainty that he is meant all the way through. And uh, what's interesting here is how sloppy this writing is in this passage. Um, going back to what you were saying about you know who's who's this talking about what's it denying here and there uh if you look just just follow with me ladies and gentlemen so muslims will say that this starting in verse nine is referring the hymn here is referring to abu jahl so uh one of muhammad's enemies the leader of the Quraysh. have you seen him who dissuades a slave when he prays supposedly the slave here is muhammad and abu jahl is not letting muhammad uh, pray, uh, you know, bow down and pray towards that, uh, that giant uh, pagan Borg cube called the Kaaba, right? So Abu Jahl is supposedly keeping Muhammad from going to the Kaaba and praying. So have you seen him who dissuades a slave when he prays? Have you seen if he relies on the guidance or commands piety? Now, supposedly, supposedly, according to Muslim commentators, now this is directed towards Abu Jahl. Have you, Abu Jahl, before you're criticizing Muhammad and stopping him from praying, have you bothered to look and see if Muhammad is relying on true guidance or if Muhammad is commanding actual good things, if he's commanding piety, right? Have you seen if he, have you seen if he denies and is defiant? So supposedly this is Allah speaking to Abu Jahl about Muhammad. So he's speaking directly to Abu Jahl so second person, and he's speaking about Muhammad in the third person. And then is he then unaware that Allah sees? Well, who's he now? Well, there's confusion. Some people say this is talking about it, whether Muhammad is unaware of Allah sees and still talking to Abu Jahl, or is it Abu Jahl? Uh, is Abu Jahl unaware that Allah sees what he's doing? But then... It can be Muhammad because 15 says he better stop. Yeah, yeah, but no, no, but it, the, the, anyway, the, the, it's the commentators that the, the commentators say it shifts to who it's talking about right here. Uh, so it shifts in, in ver between verses fourteen and fifteen. So okay. there it's saying there he's speaking to Abu Jahl about Muhammad, and then it switched to talking about Abu Jahl. But notice it's just he 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 he, and you have to figure out well this he is Muhammad, this he is Abu Jahl, this he is Muhammad, this he is Abu Jahl. Here he's speaking second person to Abu Jahl, then he's speaking uh, third person about Abu Jahl. And you can look at the commentaries and they give all sorts of, well, you know, some people think that this is talking about Muhammad. Look, if you can't tell whether a verse is talking about Muhammad or his main enemy, <laughs> you, got, you, got some prob you got some problems here. Oh, yeah. And it's important to note that all these traditions, all these commentators that you're talking about and these differences of opinion, it's all imposed upon the text. The text itself does not give you any help. All it does is give you a lot of problems. And then the commentators try to muddle through and figure them out any way that they possibly can. But that is something that is imposed upon the Quran from without. It is does not come from the clear book from within. The clear book itself is pretty much a mess. 
and uh, this this chapter is 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 full of indications that it is thrown together from various disparate fragments that have no relation to one another and so it may be that 15 refers to the same person we will seize him by the forelock if he doesn't stop that is referred to in 14 but on the other hand because there's that no indeed there it may be somebody else altogether in a completely different context uh and and that is that is the problem so so ladies and gentlemen keep in mind what we're saying here this is everyone agrees that this is composed of at least two to three parts this chapter right it's at least two to three parts uh, it's at least the first five verses and then the part after that, although there seems to be a, a couple of verses that are transitional before you get to the part that's clearly about Abu Jahl. But the rest of it doesn't seem to be tied together by anything except for the repetition of no, indeed, no, indeed. And so who's to say if 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 it's agreed upon that this chapter is being jumbled together from different eras, uh, different times in Muhammad's uh, career, Who's to say that this isn't, you know, five or six or seven different things and that this isn't just talking about Abu Jahl. This is talking about a couple of different people. We have no idea. Weird situation here. Uh, but uh, Robert here, you have this. Uh, no, indeed. But if he doesn't stop, we will seize him by the forelock, the lying sinful forelock. <laughs> Muslims actually use that as one of their main examples of scientific miracles in the Quran. Uh, they'll translate that as as instead of the forelock on the front of your head. Um, they'll they'll say this refers to the front of the brain and the front of the brain is where you decide whether you're gonna you're gonna lie and deceive or not and therefore how could how could muhammad have known that the front part of the brain is where you know you're deciding to be deceptive then why does he call it a word that has to do with hair yeah yeah and that's the thing everyone translates it as for everyone translates it as forelock yeah. it's just uh you're kind of uh if you're kind of desperate then <laughs> then uh i guess you'll cling to anything you can well if your hair is lying then you're in, you've got more troubles than that anyway. Uh, in the notes here in the Critical Quran, uh, I uh, quote Richard Bell, who was a great scholar of the Quran, examined the text critically with in more detail than uh, I believe probably anyone in history. And uh, he thinks that verse 15 seems to have been a later insertion, which goes with the no indeed problem. And then you note that uh, I didn't translate the word zabaniya. Uh, because he says that the sense of this word is not clear. Even though the Quran tells us it's clear, there are quite a number of words, and I note many of them in the critical Quran, that are not Arabic and that are not clear, and that nobody really knows what they are, what they mean at all. Their meaning in Islamic theology is established not by the sense of the word, but by the consensus of the commentators. And Zabaniya is one of them. Nobody really knows who they are that are being called and so yeah, that's norm, by, isn't that normal something normally something like guardians of hell or keepers yep. of, the, of hell or something like that yeah they the the people who are guarding the the wardens the the prison guards there in hell mm -hmm. or the or the angels who carry you off to hell when you die mm -hmm. but uh nobody really knows it's all a guess so and it's so the, your book remains completely opaque in this instance so it's uh it's the same situation that we've talked about repeatedly so far, namely that the earlier you go, the less you know, and the more time goes on, somehow they magically know more, when all it really is is their scholars sort of okay in 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 order to certainty is more important in Islam than being honest and objective. So we're just gonna we're just gonna stomp our foot and say this is the correct interpretation. It's the it's the same thing early on because that was built into Islam. Same thing with Uthman. Hey, you have all these different competing Qurans going around, all these different competing readings, and Uthman says, No, burn it all. Let's just act like there's just one. Let's just act like there's one. And so that that's Muslim commentators have been doing that for, for centuries with their interpretations. There you go. And so in this case I didn't translate it because to translate it would be to validate this consensus that is based on nothing. Mm. It's like having a, a big high-rise building with no first floor. And there's a lot in Islam like that. It's just hanging there in the air. About prostrate yourself and draw near. Going back to uh, the commentary on verse 5, I put this, that uh, the great philologist Christoph Luxemburg says that... Uh, if you look at the Syriac, if you take away the diacritical, the Arabic diacritical marks and repoint, give diacritical marks to this text that are Syriac, 
then he says that it becomes clear and coherent and that it is a Christian text referring to the Eucharist. And prostrate yourself and draw near actually means, actually in the original says, return to your religious practices and take part in the offering that is the Eucharist. Uh, and he explains why that is. I've got some of it in the note, but it's interesting to note that a great deal of the Quran does actually make more sense if you strip out the Arabic diacritical marks and treat it as if it were Aramaic or Syriac and put in the marks for that. And then some of these very strange and opaque passages do start to become actually clear as the Quran promises it is all the way through. But in a sense that has pretty much nothing to do with how it's generally understood in the Arabic. And this is so notice, notice the problem here, ladies and gentlemen, you got a text, supposedly um, a combination of the first verses that Muhammad received and uh, some later verses about him, him interacting with, uh, with one of his enemies. And uh, by every indication we can actually uh, examine, it looks like a bunch of things were jumbled together. Uh, the transitions make absolutely no sense and it's supposedly the eternal the eternal perfect speech of allah and is perfectly clear um, you can go to multiple verses in here and no one can agree on what they're saying um, you have uh, allah trying to tell a story about something that happened between muhammad and abu jahl and you can't even figure out who it's talking about because it says he 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 and then switches back and forth between you and he and no one can figure out what's being said and then you've got issues, you've got, you've got words that no one knows what they mean. They pretend they know now, but you know, if you go back, they, they don't understand what these things meant. And then the, the fact that if you consider this a plagiarism, one of Muhammad's many, 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 many plagiarisms from things that other people were saying as part of their sources and just a, a, an Islamic sort of baptism of other people's sources into Islam to be put to Islamic use, suddenly... It, it actually makes more sense and the text becomes clear. That's very strange if this text is actually Allah's eternal speech, that if you take Allah's eternal speech and then start considering it as something that was drawn from a, from a Christian source in another language, it suddenly makes sense. But that Allah's speech doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense the way it's, it's written. This is very, very, this is very, it's kind of funny. <laughs> well, you know, Allah's the best of schemers there, David. He sure is. It's quite a scheme here. Oh, but that's very fixed. All right, so so we have we have gone through Surah ninety six officially, right? Yeah, I think that's about it. I don't know. Uh, I mean, I'm sure there's much more that can be said, but that's what uh, the basically what the critical Quran has, and it raises a number of questions about the text. Really, there can't be certain answers. It's just a text that is mysterious in various ways. And as you noted, this causes all kinds of problems for Islam because it's a foundational text for Islam on which is based one of the foremost stories about Muhammad as a prophet at all. But it's it's based on nothing. It's based on an essentially incoherent and opaque text. And so, ladies and gentlemen, how you want to use this is you want to read, uh, unlike Muhammad, you'll want to read Surah 96, multiple times to get a feel for it. Uh, understand what and understand what's been said here. Uh, if you grab a copy of the Critical Quran, again, links is in the description box. If you get a copy of the Critical Quran, read the notes. And then in your conversations with your Muslim friends, um, start asking them, do, you know, do they know what Muhammad's first revelations were and so on? If they know, they'll start talking about Surah 96. And then, hey, why don't we take a why don't we take a closer look at at this? And now you know significantly more than your friend does about this and you can start bringing up some of these problems um before we head out so yeah ladies and gentlemen we wanted to we, we basically wanted to cover sir 96 and then and then stop when we're done so that the video is uh does is isn't longer than it needs to be there's one more issue i wanted to 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 bring out here so there are there are two supposed scientific miracles in here both of them based on massive massive reinterpretations of simple words so you have Alak, which is blood clot, and then they'll try to, uh, I think since the time of uh, the Bible and the Quran and the light of science, uh, when that monstrosity came out, where you had that guy who's uh, paid by King Faisal and so on to find these scientific miracles, and he says that Alak actually means that which clings, but oh, an embryo clings to the side of the womb, you see, it's a miracle, right? Uh, yeah, problem is, the, the standard meaning, meaning for 14 centuries was blood clot, that's what it meant according to uh, Muhammad and his companions. 
And then later, of course, you have the, the amazing forelock, and it's very simple, common phrase during the time of Muhammad. If you wanted to control someone, you reached out and grabbed him by the, the, the lock of the front of his hair, and so you could drag him around and control him. That's what it was saying. But somehow it, it, it's talking about the, the workings of the brain and so on. So you have that. So notice you've already got two, uh, two miracles of Islam right here in this passage, but then there's actually uh, a, a Bible prophecy that's based on this entire story. So um, this is Isaiah chapter 29, and look at verse 12 there, and this is where they get it. And when they give the book to one who cannot read, saying, read this, he says, I cannot read. Oh my goodness. And you look at what Muslims will say about this, and you know, Ahmed Didat and Zakir Naik, they're saying, ah, so the, the Bible is talking about a prophet. The Bible is talking about a prophet here, and the book is given to the prophet, and the prophet says, I cannot read. This is exactly what happened with the angel Gabriel and Prophet Muhammad when he was given the Quran. When, if you actually look in context here, this is talking about the revelation that is given to Isaiah filled with uh, what God, how God is going to judge the people of Judah. And so it's a revelation given to the prophet Isaiah and Isaiah reports this to people and he's saying that people won't accept the revelation. They will refuse to accept the revelation that's given to them about the bad things that are going to happen to them. So if you read uh, verses one through 10, that's what you get. Uh, it's a revelation about what God's going to do for people rebelling uh, against his revelations and, uh, and uh, turning towards polytheism. And then you have here, what's going to happen when Isaiah tells this to people and it says, and the vision of all this has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed. When men give it to one who can read saying, read this, he says, I cannot for it is sealed. And when they give the book to one who cannot read saying, read this, he says, I cannot read. The point is they make excuses for why they won't believe in the, they won't even pay attention to the revelations that are being given to them. There are only two categories of people. Uh, people there are people who can read and there are people who can't read. And he says, look, if you give this, this book, this revelation about the impending judgment to someone who can read, he'll say, uh, I can't because it's sealed. And if you give it to someone who can't read, he'll say, I can't read. And so either way, no matter what the situation is, people are going to reject the revelation. And so what's just hilarious is Muslims are saying, hey, this narrative in Isaiah 29 about people stubbornly refusing to believe in God's revelations because they don't want to, they just don't want to accept these kinds of things. That's actually talking about Muhammad. Okay, so Muhammad is a, in rebellion against the true revelations of the book of Isaiah. That's all we conclude if you're telling us that's, that's Muhammad. But my goodness, the level of desperation. All right, Robert, any final thoughts here on, uh, on Surah 96 before we close out? Well, I think that it's clear from all that we've discussed here that it's not the first revelation. It's probably not the first surah. It's probably not even one single surah. And that calls into question the integrity of the Quran entirely, entirely as a unit. It's a patchwork of things thrown together rather haphazardly and in a way that sometimes makes no sense at all. And Surah 96, a foundational text of Islam, is a key example of that. And so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, notice this is what happens when you start to examine the Quran. All you see are problems. I mean, how many problems did we spot just by reading one short chapter of the Quran and supposedly one, supposedly one of the greatest? I mean, keep in mind, this is, I mean, Allah's got to come out with his best stuff first, right? I mean, he's got to come, he's got to come with straight fire if he's trying to persuade people that, you know, th these are the new revelations and he's got a new prophet. And what he comes with is, you're created from a blood clot. No, no indeed. <laughs> No, indeed, right? That's, that would be the only interpretation that made sense if Allah remember, realizes later, wait a minute, no, I didn't, that makes no sense. <laughs> <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, well, uh, everyone, uh, uh, if you'd like to see us go through more uh, passages of the Quran in the future, it's easy to do with, with one of the short chapters, like, you know, the, the later chapters in the Quran, um, with, with longer chapters, maybe a certain specific section or something like that. But if you'd like to see us go through more of the critical Quran and take a critical look at uh, various passages or, or some of the shorter chapters of the Quran, let us know. Uh, make some recommendations in the description box and maybe we'll take a look, a critical look, at the passage you recommend. All right, Robert, uh, I guess, well, I guess we'll be back for Jihad here in a couple of days. Yes, indeed. There's always more jihad. Yeah, and unfortunately, I mean, I don't even pay attention to a lot of what's going on, but even I've been uh, seeing some stories about the jihad and mosque attacks, Muslims blowing up each other's mosques and so on. Indeed. No uh, right. need. 
No, indeed. <laughs> no, I'm going to want to say that. <laughs> by, by by the way, ladies and gentlemen, side note, that's actually a good introduction. You got to think of creative, creative ways to transition to topics. Uh, but you, you could just be having a discussion with your Muslim friend, whatever you just said, then say, no, indeed. And he'll go, what? What are you talking about? And then keep doing it. Keep saying, keep saying something and then say, no, indeed. And then he'll finally say, what are you talking about? You say, well, Allah does it. And he's got the best speech ever. So I'm just imitating Allah. All right. Well, <laughs> until next time, this has been A Critical Look. Surah 96 of the Quran.